This is Musings of the Shy Podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. So on this episode, which is a part of this series, I'm going to talk about the aftermath of the Silk Road Marketplace collapse and the various issues and problems as well as solutions that have come out of um, this collapse. Um, this first episode is going to talk about the the corrupt agents, both the FBI agent, the Secret Service agent, and the possible third um, law enforcement agent that has corrupted the Silk Road case. Um, it may have heavily influenced, or even allegedly been part of Russell Bridge's lawyers, but it may have in fact framed Russell Bridge or altered enough documents to make it a reasonable doubt case for Russell Bridge's guilt when it comes to the mastermind of the entirety of the Silk Road marketplace. Uh, but the first episode of this uh, series is uh, Agents of Silk Road, where we discuss um, these corrupt agents. The next one will be about the fungibility of Bitcoin, how the aftermath of the Silk Road has created vivid inefficient when it comes to certain Bitcoiners. Uh, the rise of privacy cash, um, because Bitcoin is not truly anonymous, we see the rise of the creation of cryptocurrencies to address that particular issue. Um, exchanges, because of Mount Gauss, um, ties to Silk Road, but just in general, uh, the solutions that people have when it comes to obtaining a Bitcoin. Because the other thing is Silk Road is, um, you know, you could actually do it by money order or the cash that is already there, the rises of exchanges. Uh, we are not going to touch on the whole Bitcoin uh, limited and poor and the whole block size to date and those exchanges. Um, we may have some news about China and the city seeing uh, those uh, exchanges have not yet released their funds to their customers, but what we'll talk about exchanges and then decentralization, uh, decentralizing marketplaces, decentralizing exchanges, decentralizing basically everything uh, as a result of the wave of the collapse of the Silk Road marketplace. Governments um, prosecution as well as a number of other vendors, which we'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but still, from just basically in general, just the way of the parts are so broke. But before we get into all of that, uh, the next. So, BitBond and BitPace are two uh, pretty prominent um, Bitcoin. Companies are targeting key behemoths for African businesses. Bitbond and Bitpesa, uh, this comes from Brandon McCoy, Bit by Luke Parker, recently announced a new initiative offering small business owners to Canadians and Nigerians, Tanzanians, and Ugandans in a bid to improve access to finances for SMEs in Africa. Uh, the move allowed Bitbond borrow to foreign countries to withdraw loans into their mobile money or bank account. Almost 20 years according to Bitbond's announcement. The partnership connects borrowers in Africa with the German peer to peer lender Bitbond using their mobile phones. The Bitcoin based mobile payment provider BitPesa provides the loans within minutes. Calling itself the first global market payment platform for small business loans, Bitbond has been on by peer to peer lending with Bitcoin since July 2013. The growing business connects individuals with fixed income. Investors from around the world with small businesses and plans to title the very first German ringgit regulated financial service provider that uses blockchain technology. The tech firm has since raised funds on the three different occasions, including uh, 200,000 accounts in 2014, 600,000 in the actual euro following May, and another US 1.2 million in February this year. The funds have allowed the platform to facilitate over 1,650 loans to small businesses in over 120 countries so far. Loans on the platform can be denominated in US dollars, euros, or different Bitcoin. By far, how far the service fraud serves only as to register businesses, which are subject to credit checks. Fraud is a problem faced by every company in the industry, in the industry, from the TCGM. Uh, the risk management process appears to have been helping the platform. Say on the right side of regulators, too, a problem that forced Bitmain Club to close late last year. So this is good. Um, this is something that a lot of people are saying, like the peer-to-peer market, as far as loans or going after that small business, uh, B2B businesses, is something that Bitcoin could be a solution for, particularly in emerging markets like uh, countries like Africa or just emerging markets like different 
types of businesses that are growing. They're not necessarily traditional type of businesses that don't necessarily be seen as something more than uh, you see traditional investment in. So this is a good thing. Uh, tech revolution. Cryptocurrency versus personal computers. If you be with Alan Young, I have a link in the show notes for this. It's a VCE brief. Uh, this kind of gives you a brief understanding. Like many technology advances before, cryptocurrency has spawned a rapid development industry. In this highly competitive field, it's important to have a very have every advantage you can get. Anyone can put it together a team of individuals who give themselves impressive setting titles, but few have watched the process of innovation take place firsthand, because most are too young to remember the internet and personal computer phones, as well as the expensive bubbles. The same cannot be said for Dino's co-founder Alan Young, a man who has 40 years of business experience including 20 years as a pioneer in the German software and personal computer industry. His company, Dolphin Technology, went head to head with industry giants such as Apple Computer Inc., Cleaning Corp., and Motorola in the early days of the personal computer revolution. Since he has been first hand with the trials and tribulations that projects in the emerging tech sector, sectors can face, he knows better than most of how to avoid the pitfalls that threaten most entrepreneurs. So it was a great little read about those who are interested in. How you can you know, facilitate and best improve your business. China strikes a path to develop its own digital currency. China's central bank takes a step closer to create a nationally recognized digital currency. Uh, there's also an agreement that's kind of version between Japan and, and uh, China for a little section that they share to ter- territorial control over to create a, a cryptocurrency within that space as well. Uh, the People's Bank of China has reportedly taken steps to develop a digital currency of its own. In 2014, China is a research team to study digital currencies and application scenarios by collaborating with ex- experts with Citigroup Incorporated and Delight LLP. Although he did not specify what technology the BB will see we use to issue digital currencies, how it will work in relationship to Beyond. A, a later 2016 research paper did outline ways the national digital currency could work. The BOC would create and transfer cryptocurrencies to a commercial bank when more liquidity is needed. Using modified ATMs or bank tellers, the consumer can refill the digital currency that is stored in an e wallet, mobile phone, or other device. For purchases, consumers can wire cryptocurrency from a personal wallet to a merchant's account, and merchants can then deposit cryptocurrency payments to their respective commercial bank accounts. Uh, this is all from Keith News, and it's written by Los uh, Silvia. Chinese consumers are already well versed in executing transactions with their mobile devices through payment services as Alipay or WeChat. Soft drink purchases can even be made from vending machines by scanning the QR codes with smartphone applica- applications that are linked to bank accounts. For merchants or private sellers, digital payments will be sent through the peer, lowering transaction costs and cutting out the middlemen like banks and third party brokers. According to Bloomberg, the PUC has initiated trial runs of this prototype cryptocurrency in the steady investments towards becoming one of the first major banks to issue digital money. While this move by central banks seems encouraging to some digital currency enthusiasts, the PLC has always increased scrutiny of Bitcoin, causing two of China's most popular exchanges, OKCoin and Fubio, to suspend Bitcoin and Litecoin withdrawals. This move that took place in early February 2017 was enacted by the PDOC. The PDOC is a way to address money laundering and market integration in capital flight and transfer Chinese money out of the country. And something that hasn't yet been remedied, but uh, zero fees is something that uh, for trading in KYC is something that's being done on these exchanges, but actual draws have not yet quite occurred for a number of these uh, Chinese exchanges. You need to know precisely how much banks lend, where the money goes, and the piece of credit creation is the key to curbing money laundering and making market monetary policy more effective. Other benefits of digital currency include the reduction of costs associated with printing money, minting coins, and combating, combating paper note counterfeits. In a country of 1.4 billion people, managing and circulating physical money can be very expensive. Using digital currencies to supplement the cash and circulation can improve speed and convenience while providing unprecedented transparency in transactions. Because of these benefits and training willingness about the technology, a national digital currency seems like a natural transition for tech savvy consumers. And this is a secret of all expenses. And the article continues on forward. So, 
it's a, it's a race to see who will come up first with a successful digital currency. Um, I think it will be China. And we'll see what that will mean for the rest of the cryptocurrencies in the world. But again, we'll also see what happens to China because they're going to have to deal with all the same issues that other cryptocurrencies deal with. And is this, is this going to be centralized? Is it going to be decentralized? Is anyone going to be able to participate with votes and money and all that? Uh, your internet history is on sale for the highest bidder. So it goes from register. U.S. Congress votes to shred ISP privacy rules. If the House passes a law, here's what you should do about it. This article is from Karen McCarthy. It's already passed the Senate, so basically once the, the Senate and the U.S. House of Representatives bills have been coalesced together, it's going to be sitting on the President's desk, um, probably either by the end of the week or sometime next week. The U.S. House of Representatives has just approved the Congressional Disapproval Vote on Privacy Rules, which give your ISPs the right to sell your internet history to the highest bidder. The measure passed by 232 votes to 184 along party lines, with one Democrat voting in favor and 14 not voting. Mm. This follows the same vote in the Senate last week. Just prior to the vote, a White House spokesman said that the President supported the bill, meaning the decision will soon become law. The approval means that whoever you pay to provide the internet access, Comcast, AT&T, Time Warner, Cable, etc., will be able to sell everything they know about you, about your use of the internet to third parties without requiring your approval or even informing you. Your ISP already knows quite a lot about you, your name and address, and quite possibly your age, and most of your other personal, personally identical information, such as your social security number. That, that's on the customer information side. On the service side, they know which websites you visit, when, and how often. So... Everything is for sale. No good thing is going to come from this. It's just, it's just not. Uh, some positive news. SpaceX is about to make history by relaunching a used Falcon 9 rocket. And the vehicle is going to attempt another one too. This is from The Verge. On Thursday, SpaceX is set to launch yet another satellite into orbit. From the Florida coast, but this mission will be far from the routine for the company. The Falcon 9 skyrocket that the SpaceX is using for the launch has already flown before. Around the same time last year, it sent cargo to the International Space Station for NASA and then came back to Earth to land upright on a floating drone ship at sea. This is the first time that SpaceX will attempt to reuse one of its rockets. It's a feat that SpaceX has been working towards for more than five years now and could be a watershed moment for the aerospace industry. Up to now, practically all rockets that can achieve orbit are either destroyed or go onward covered after each mission. That means an entirely new rocket, which costs tens to hundreds of millions of dollars to make, has to be built for each launch. But SpaceX has planned to recover its rockets after launch rather than throwing them away so the vehicles can be reused again. This way, the company can save on manufacturing a completely new vehicle and potentially lower the cost of each mission. Uh, if this is very successful, not only will this usher a new wave of space everything from launching you know, satellites, putting more things up into orbit, maybe possibly clean up stuff in orbit, but cut down environmental costs, all the type of, you know, just the raw material necessary to make um, a rocket, you know, uh, will be, you know, just environmentally speaking, will be very useful. And last bit of bad news, motherboard. This map will show you if your web traffic passes through an NSA listening post by Farina Farik. Um, Nine Maps wants to make visible the secret, dangerous, and often illegal forms of surveillance as they're increasingly becoming part of every, everyday life. Internet data pin pals, pinballs across national borders. And for Canadians, this means potentially exposing it, it to eavesdropping by U.S. based corporations and the National Security Agency. Now, an interactive map tool named Internet Exchange Mapping, or uh, Nine Maps, uh, relaunched for public use today, and we'll show you how and how easily your data can be spied on for tracing the oftentimes Byzantine routes, routes the data takes when traversing the Internet. Uh, Nine Maps looks at what are known as trace routes, the geographic path that data takes when bouncing through internet exchanges, building connections to most important internet cables, 
In a for example, is known to install listening posts in some of these buildings and can listen in on the data that passes through. The point of nine maps is to reveal how, how your data might pass through one of these listening posts. So the site's founder and University of Toronto professor Andrew Clement. The idea is to make vi visible the secret, dangerous, and often illegal forms of surveillance that is increasing to our everyday life, he said in the interview. The current version of IMAS was developed with the help of Open Media, the Canadian Internet Registry Authority, which manages the, the CA domain, and the Office of Privacy Consumers of Canada. Projects have been worked since 2008. So there'll be a link in the show notes. Um, I'm going to personally check this out and see what this means. <sighs> Kids these days. I, I don't know what else to say. Um, other than this for the rest of the show with talking about the agents of Silk Road. So let's do a little recap. After the sentencing of Ross Albridge, uh, these indictments against these two federal agents, uh, one a former Secret Service agent uh, who eventually would accept the plea agreement and receive uh, 71 months in prison, uh, Sean W. Bridges, and then Carl Force the fourth, who is a DE agent, their indictments came after the sentencing. Now it was known by both the defense and the prosecutor that there was an investigation of these two corrupt uh, federal agents, but the defense was not allowed to present um, any of this information at trial. It was only after the fact. There was gag orders and everything like that after the sentencing did this come out, and that's why a lot of uproar is when it comes to the Ross Ulbrich case, in particular not only this but the many um, unindicted uh, murder charges that were left on the docket, uh, one of which it turns out was a uh, scheme that one of these corrupt agents participated in where they faked, um, excuse me, Curtis Green's death and uh, presented to uh, Greg Pye Roberts who allegedly uh, who has been convicted Ross Elbridge as being uh, that they committed this um, murder for hire. Um, and because of that, you know, there's a lot of suspect that a lot of the activities are happening or were happening on the Silk Road marketplace. Uh, there could be a legitimate case and it's something the lawyers are trying to appeal and make that you know, not only was Ross Elbridge not in charge of the Silk Road marketplace for the entire time, but records were altered, things have changed. Uh, the fact that the mysterious server has popped up in other forums where the lawyers uh, for Russell Lynch have alleged that there is evidence that there was, in fact, another corrupt agent um, working within the Silk Road marketplace. But the second thing being, um, which was revealed, and it's more and more this uh, server is analyzed, that uh, somebody had locked in as the Great Pirate Roberts while Russell Lynch was in custody. How uh, that could that happen if Russell Bridge is the sole person responsible and in charge of the Drew Hyatt Roberts identity. So this is from San Francisco, released by the FBI, um, December 7th, 2015, when you February of 2015, Ross Ulbrich was sentenced to life in prison. Um, a former Secret, Secret Service Special Agent who'd been a member of the Baltimore Silk Road Task Force was sentenced to 71 months in prison today. Are charges of money laundering and obstruction of justice. Uh, U.S. District Judge Richard Seaborn of the North District of California sentenced Sean W. Bridges, 33, in rural Maryland and San Francisco, following his guilty plea to one count of money laundering and one count of obstruction of justice. Judge Seaborn also ordered Bridges to forfeit $651,000. Between 2012 and 2014, Bridges was assigned to the Baltimore Silk Road Task Force, a multi agency group investigating illegal activity on the Silk Road. A coveted a covert online marketplace for illicit goods, primary drugs. British responsibility include, among other things, conducting forensic computer investigation and in effort to locate, identify, and prosecute targets, including Ross Ulbrich, aka Dread Pirate Roberts, who ran the Silk Road from the North District of California. As part of his plea deal, uh, or guilty plea, uh, British submitted to using the account information he obtained during the January 20, 2013 search and arrest of Curtis Green. The customer support representative of Silk Road to reset passwords and connect to various accounts in Silk Road and move approximately 20,000 Bitcoin at the time with about $350,000. 20,000 Bitcoin? Whew! 
uh, into a Bitcoin wallet that bridge control, uh, bridges control. When Allbridge learned that green access in Silk Road has been used to transfer Bitcoin from Silk Road into a wallet, Allbridge Council, Council Green's administrative access of Silk Road and attempted to have them killed in retaliation for the Bitcoin thefts. Bridge admitted that he moved the stolen Bitcoin into an account at Mt. Gox, an online digital exchange based in Japan. And then between March and May 2015, he liquidated the Bitcoin into $820,000 in U.S. currency and had the funds transferred to a personal investment account in the United States. In June 2014, Bridges transferred money from the investment account into a personal account that he shared with another person. Bridge also admitted that he used Green's access to Silk Road to steal Bitcoin from the site, thereby eliminating Green's access to further the further Baltimore grand jury investigation of Albridge and Silk Road. Additionally, Bridge admitted that he made multiple false and misleading statements to both prosecutors and investigators in connection with the San Francisco grand jury investigation into his own illegal acts. Uh, Bridge is the second of two federal agents to be sentenced in connection with the Baltimore Silk Road task force investigation into Silk Road. Call M-446 of Baltimore was a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administrator. Administration was guilty on July 1st of 2015 to a three-count uh, information charge charging him with money laundering with, with uh, predicates of wire fraud and theft of government, theft of government property, destruction of justice, and extortion under the color of official right related to his theft and diversion of more than $700,000 in digital currencies which he gained control as part of the undercover role on the Baltimore Silk Road Task Force on October 19, 2015. Judge C. Wilson is forced to send eight months in prison. Um, so, basically, because uh, Sean Forrest was able to steal Curtis's Green's identity and do this, he was able to gain significant access to the Silk Road marketplace. And this is the question that... Uh, that's been proposed is that if this corrupt agent who's already lied to law enforcement, hidden money, transferred money over, even um, helped set up the whole faking of the Kurdish Green and hits. Because um, allegedly, allegedly, um, Ross Olberch wanted to hit on Kurdish Green for the theft of the Bitcoin. And Sean Bridges not only pre pretended to be at the hitman, but also pretended to be the person that would facilitate the hitman. So there's there's a lot going on here and it puts the question of alteration of records, which is something that the Ross Ulbrich um, lawyers are alleging that if this um, agent had this a level of access and was able to do these type of activities, what else could he have done? Um, could he have altered records to make it an imply that Ross Ulbrich did these other type of hits that the that Ross Ulbrich and his lawyers have denied over and over and over again that they never have facilitated or asked for a hit against not only Curtis Green but all these other people. So there's that. The fact that he basically took over Curtis Green identity, participated in the um, sanction, false um, belief that Curtis Green was dead or killed by a hit man. And then it turns out he stole all this money. And then you got the biggest character of them all, which is, um, okay, so there's a little bit of correction. It was Carl Force who pretended to be the hitman to take money from the PR. So this is from Motherboard. Uh, Carl Force was sentenced to six and a half years after abusing his position as a federal officer. Carl Mark Force, the board, shuffled in the courtroom in an orange sweatshirt and orange track pants. That Manacles on beats and clicking loudly. For some men who just look unmistakably like cops, force is one of them, a burly, thick built man with blunt features and a shiny shaved head. While it's not for the orange clothes and orange shoes he wore, he blended in perfectly with other law enforcement in the courtroom that day, each of them with broad shoulder and agreeing as bald as he was. They congregated on a single bench, bench worshipping to each other as the lawyers led the case in front of the judge. They were gathered for four sentence hearing, like the last time they would be making a public appearance for a while. At least. With nobody surprised, the prosecutor wanted the longest sentence in the range provided by sentencing guidelines 87 months. The forced defense attorney wanted the shortest 70 months. In, in the end, uh, Judge Richard Seaborn split the baby in the mid range between 78 months or six and a half years after release. Force will be under probation for another three. In July, Force pled guilty to money laundering, destruction of justice, and extortion under the color of official right. The former DA agent based in Baltimore, Maryland, a member of the Silk Road Task Force, is sprawling multi-agency, multi 
judicial law enforcement effort that eventually made Ross Ulbricht, also known as Derek Hyde Roberts. In February 2015, Ulbricht was convicted on all counts after a jury in New York. He is currently serving a life sentence. No mention of Colin Mark Force the fourth made into Ulbricht's trial. Neither did any mention of Sean Bridges, and we'll get back to Sean Bridges, the former Secret Service agent in charge alongside him. The spree of crimes they, they committed in Silk Road investigators were under the seal of grand jury secrecy at the time. Bridge used the credentials of the Silk Road moderator turned informant to rob dead pirate Roberts, administrator of the Silk Road, Curtis Green. That's who he would use. Force posed as a hitman and took money from DPR to kill the informant. So Force and Bridges then faked the brutal murder of the farmant. So they worked together on this. Ugh. Between 2012 and 2013, Force alternated between attempting to extort DPR and selling law enforcement information to him. And after Ulbricht's arrest, he continued to seize Bitcoin under the ages of DA, agent, DA authority and then launder it into his own personal account rather than giving it to the government. Uh, when he tried to launder money through Bitstamp and Vimo, the payment service froze his accounts for suspicious activity. Force then used his status as a DA agent to try to bully them to unfreezing his account. He even goes as far as to send an invalid administrative subpoena from his personal email account without his supervisor's knowledge. Yeah, so he would go around and just, like, basically mafioso style say, hey, give me your money. Or I'm the DEA. Or I'm going to come after you. It just, yeah, he was just robbing people of the line, basically. These are the only crimes we know about. There's some indication that Forrest had other personas that the government was not able to tie him to. So, yeah, there's suspicion that Forrest... Now he has more Bitcoin beyond um, what we talk, what we will talk about about the auction of um, Bitcoin, but then he may have done some other activities. Uh, he's a pretty wild character if you think about it. Uh, Forceman is charged alongside Bridges, who also pled guilty. And they, they mind you, these guys are law enforcement agent, agents. They extorted money. They funneled money into private accounts. Uh, Force shook down other businesses and the Bitcoin agency. And they're serving less than Ross Ulbricht. Uh, and not to mention the fact that they teamed up together. Uh, the Forest Bridges affair is deeply embarrassing for the government. And while it does not necessarily cast doubt on the fairness of Ulbricht's conviction, it certainly made the whole affair even a bigger circus than before, a feat that many seem to be impossible. In Sydney's hearing on Tuesday, Forrest's lawyer, Baltimore based criminal defense attorney Ivan Bates, spoke smoothly about Forrest's troubled childhood, blah, 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 that always pulled that out. In August, Force would try to sell information to DPR under the name French Maid. At one point, Force accidentally signed off as Carl. They had to follow up. I'm sorry about that. My name is Carla Sophia, and I have many boyfriends and girlfriends on the marketplace. The bizarre mistake is maybe, maybe more explicable in the context of a serious drinking problem and a mental health breakdown. The DA knew about Force's mental health issues to base. He argued there was an outrageous government conduct to put him under on another undercover assignment after his previous undercover assignment had ended so disastrously. The assignment in Denver in 2004 had ended up with a DUI. The second under undercover assignment in Puerto Rico had ended in 2008 with a complete mental breakdown. Force was institutionalized and not returned his job until 2010. He was on desk duty until 2012 when he was assigned to investigate Silk Road. It was an undercover assignment, but he wasn't exactly out and about in the official government sock puppet of Silk Road. He was technically at the desk every day. So the U.S. attorney, and kind of skipping around here, and the case is fairly straightforward. The Karl Marx Forest Affairs is down in instances of corruption and very nearly compromised the entire Silk Road investigation. Had it not been for the New York investigation, the government's ability to prosecute Ulbricht would have been severely impaired. Many of us who work in the government operate on special commissions. In the instance, we send an incredibly dangerous message to the stress of the job with excuse to my behavior. Um, Force will be required to pay... 337k in restitutions to RP, an individual whose bitcoins were received unlawfully under the guise of the official DA business. In addition, he went up to pay 3,000 restitutions to CG, who was almost certainly incurred as Clark Green, the informant whose death uh, Forrest helped fake. Uh, in court, Forrest gave a brief statement in his claims clinking. I would like to publicly apologize to the American people, to the US government, to my friends and family. I'm sorry I lost it. I don't understand a lot of it, and I apologize. He then added slightly a little note about how he had not been able to receive his medication at once. So, yeah, there is that. Anyway, that happened in... All this happened in 2015. Then we get into 2016, 
And then we have Sean Bridges popping up again. So not the beat this is the call forces before my little health issues, but it's clearly obvious that you should never continue to have a beat with Jamie as a fall of the government. Most of the fall of the government have kind of attached to the kind of protocols and controls and this heightens from the overall sober case. I do think it factors in. I know the government's position has no effect, but the fact that both Sean Bridges and Call forces out there, you know. Well, Sean Bridges, particularly because he had curtains to gain access, could easily alter records, but uh, going out there and extorting people, um, it, should, it should factor into this case. And the fact that we don't even know all the identities that Call Force may have, in fact, utilized um, through the sober marketplace is a big, big, big question mark. So this is from Monday Board, it was occurred in February 2016. On Monday, on Monday, Wired reported that former Silk Road investigator Sean Bridges was arrested again while trying to flee the United States. While most of the details surrounding his re-arrest are still under seal, a government filing says that the law enforcement seized two bags containing identity documents, corporate records of offshore entities, including one that he created after pleading guilty in his case, a MacBook with serial numbers scratched off, and a bulletproof vest that was probably stolen from Secret Service. Call Mark Force the fourth, the other cop, cop, uh, cop charge alongside Bridges is pretty hard to beat, just name ones. But Sean Bridges has definitely had his moments. In June 2015, Bridges pled to, to corruption charges that Neil Stephens would have never written to the novel for fear of being too improbable. But prior to that, the former Secret Service agent had an illustrious career in law enforcement. He had successful, had a successful house of negotiator for three years in the Secret Service. As a Secret Service agent, he guarded the Obama as well as Simon Daniels, who worked for the National Security Agency in some as unspecified capacity. From the outside, he was a hero cop, so much so that Robert Ulrich, the former governor of Maryland, wrote a letter on his behalf asking the judge to really get his sentence. Maybe the higher you go, the further you have to fall. But the real story of Sean Bridges isn't so much a Greek tragedy as it's a collection of bizarre vintages of ballsy police misconduct, each one more ridiculous than the next. The time the British transferred 820k from Mount Gox, then served warrants on Mount Gox. Yeah, he was also part of that too, uh, which was concerning the uh, the company that Mount Gox utilized for uh, U.S. customers, which is they're both like suing each other or something like that. It's crazy. Back in May 2013, the United States government seized 2.1 million accounts belonging to Mount Gox, the world's then largest Bitcoin exchange. Sean Bridges put together an affidavit for the Caesar warrant. He wrapped it up only two days after he finished wiring, wiring so he knew it was coming down. 820k from Outgox to the Quantum International Investment LLC company that he had registered on February 12, 2013. Seriously, this guy pulled all his funds out of the Bitcoin exchange that he was about to help seize. While Bridges claims that he was following orders with the Caesar warrant, the U.S. Attorney Office is not to that he was a more nefarious motive. In a sentence hearing in December, Assistant U.S. Attorney Catherine Hong told the judge that the seizure had compromised the criminal, criminal investigation for Mount Gox, and that investigation ended up being shut down. Hong said that Bridges had compromised the criminal gains of the, against Mount Gox on purpose because he feared being exposed. Exposed for what? You might ask. Well, let's start with about 820k came from. The time that Bridges stole 20,000 Bitcoin from Joe Pyro Roberts, then set up a cooperative witness for the fall. At the time, Sean Bridges was an agent working with the Silk Road Task Force, a multi-agency effort that stand across many jurisdictions. This mission to identify the Dread Pirate Roberts and take down the new online black market that he operated. In early 2013, that they made a big break in the case when law enforcement identified and apprehended Curtis Green, one of the Silk Road moderators. Green rolled over and agreed to cooperate. The moderator turned witness gave law enforcement his login credentials and on January 25th, He debriefed call force, Sean Bridges, and other Baltimore based agents on how to log into Silk Road vendor accounts and reset passwords and how to change the status of a seller to a vendor and how to reset pins. Bridges left the information session in the afternoon, and during the afternoon and into the night, the Silk Road website suffered a series of sizable thefts. The Silk Road task force blamed Curtis Green, the Dread Pirate Roberts blamed Curtis Green. Poor Green was left uh, failing, unable to explain why this enormous threat. 
can be traced back to his own account. DPR caught wind that Green was cooperating in law enforcement, and since by both this and the theft, he ordered a hit on his former employee. Fortunately for Green, this hitman turned out to be the uncovered Carl Marx of Forth. Of course, Forth of Bridge helped fake Green's death, and then they doctored proof of death photos to send to DPR. Uh, Curtis Green didn't find out who had done it wrong until much, much later. While in hiding, he kept cooperating with the investigation, although getting the theft pinned on him and putting his plea in jeopardy. Green gave a victim statement at Bridges sentences, only sobbing in court and told the judge that he had taught Forrest and Bridge how to move Bitcoin and how to essentially hide it, thinking that he was helping the investigation since these are the good guys. Uh, the time the bridge was guarded in first lady, no one really knows the true extent of Bridges' activities until Carl Force, who was also very sloppy in his shady dealings. Bridge was quite sophisticated, see for example the offshore entities he discovered in his rearrest. Bridges was cryptocurrency expert, according to the AUSA Ahan. His involvement with digital currency cases across the country caused a staggering number of investigations to become tainted, and some countries shut down. She told the judge as Bridges sentencing the corrupt agent had been looking out for opportunities to serve seizure warrants and somehow profit from it. So he was also doing what um, Carl Force was doing, which was shaking uh, Bitcoin businesses down. But the prosecutor also said the big coins were still missing and they weren't sure if he had worked with other corrupt agents, which we'll get to when we talk about uh, Ross Ulbrich's um, uh, lawyer's alleged, alleged that, um, fact that there might be a third person involved. The U.S. Attorney Office seems to imply that there's been a lot of weird but not necessarily chargeable stuff that's still unaccounted for. In other words, she's convinced that Bridge hasn't really made a clean breast of it. One of the examples she gave was a suspicious text conversation between Bridges and an, an unnamed IRS agent who was not, who was not charged in the case, in which the two talked about how much money they were making on the market, presumably in the dual currency market, even as Bridges boasted about guarding Mrs. Obama at the very moment. A time the Bridges tried to establish, he tried to sell, selfie slip his computer onto a pile of laptops that IT was wiping. It took a while for anyone to catch on to what Bridges was doing, and may have never been caught if forced. The forces unrelated slip lots had draw, drawn attention to Bridges' own activities. In May 2014, after some really weird interactions with Paul Forrest, Bitcoin exchanged this stamp reported him to his superior. On March 18, 2015, Bridges was suspended upon his pull, You can't suspend me, actually, I resign. But before he did that, the former agent asked his supervisor if he can access his Dell laptop computer to copy electronic receipts or personal items he had purchased from internet merchants. When the supervisor glanced over his shoulder, the supervisor realized that Bridge wasn't copying receipts, he was copying a folder named this down. The supervisor put a stop to that right away. Then Bridges, who had been told to leave his work computer and the evidence vault, sneakily slipped onto one of the laptops in the cabinet directly above an area that the USSS Baltimore personnel used as a wipe station. It's not clear whether the Baltimore Secret Service IT actually wiped the laptop. I'm betting, since they didn't find it, and they're not using it against them, they had. Uh, that time, the bridge is truly married his girlfriend right before she was scheduled to testify in his own grand jury investigation. This guy, man. The story came out that during the bridge's sentencing hearing, while the grand jury investigation was proceeding against Forrest and Bridges, Bridges' then girlfriend, Ariana Espinito, had been called to testify. Espinito asked for a week's repeat due to her schedule. It was granted. That very weekend, Espinito and Bridges got married. Espino revoked his special immunity and never testified the case against her husband. I'm 90% sure this is a potline for market prior. And according to Bridges, they had married so that the form, former agent could have health insurance. So the fact that the uh, U.S. attorneys are openly admitted in court that there might be actual other corrupt agents, that not all Bitcoin has been, you might say, processed, that there is these uh, weird identities that are attributed to call force, and that Sean Bridges. The most shady is of them all, the fact that he was trying to flee the country, married his then girlfriend, and they have wiped out evidence, and somehow it's, it's associated with this bit stamp, just like force, that there is a very significantly strong case that Ross Ulbrich, upon appeal, should have, really should have. Uh, the fact that one of the biggest concerns when it comes to Mt. Gox is some of these um, investigations to a lot of the number of uh, questionable Bitcoin companies is the fact that there has not been 
criminal charges, even though it appears obvious that there's been criminal activity. It appears that the Baltimore task force might have been the epic center of a lot of investigations into these Bitcoin companies, but now those investigations, as in the case of Mel Gox, can't go forward because of Sean Bridges. So for two and a half years, this is from Wired, and it's being written by Lee Greenberg, uh, the black market bizarre known as the Silk Road wrote tens of thousands of drug dealers and customers with a promise of anonymous cars, as well as at least two corrupt law enforcement agents who tried to profit from the dark web business they were meant to investigate. Now the defense team of the Sykes creator says it found signs of a third row cop tied to the Silk Road's drug money. And this one they say remains at large. In a press conference today, this took place uh, in November of last year. Solberg's um, attorney announced that they've dug up private chat logs from the site's user forum. They shed light on a mysterious figure known as Alberto Pacino, Al Pacino, or not warnable in chats with Jared Pirate Roberts, the pseudonym that Solberg used on the site. Albert Pacino offered information about law enforcement investigations with the Silk Road in exchange for weekly payments, which is something for both Force and Bridges did as well to all uh, Ross Ulbrich. And according to the defense team, those chats didn't appear in earlier versions of the forum logs shared by the prosecution and defense, suggesting that someone in law enforcement tampered with evidence to cover up those conversations. The defense team discovered the chats in a new, newly unearthed copy of the user forum backed up to an obscure sub-director in the site's server. The revelation follows the conviction of last year of two Silk Road investigators, a Secret Service agent and a Drug Enforcement Administrator agent who used pseudonyms to steal Bitcoin from the site, and sent them to sort money from Albrecht and also sold him law enforcement information. As Albrecht's lawyers continued to appeal their client's conviction on charges including narcotics trafficking and money laundering, as well as the life sentence he received, the defense sites assigned of a third rogue agent with potential access to the evidence as an indication that the Albridge trial was flawed and unjust. We find that this to be a significant discovery, considering that we always believe that there was, well, was other corruption that we didn't know about, and the government didn't know about either. This is the U.S. one of Albridge's turn. It further calls into question the integrity of the entire Silk Road investigation. For those who follow the Silk Road saga, the existence of Albridge was exactly a secret. A diary that Albridge kept on his laptop, which, which was introduced as evidence in Albridge's 2015 trial, learned that Al Pacino from has been accused of the and credited the ball with helping to prevent one of the site's drug dealers from being arrested. The text file that Albert stole on his computer and made one of his counterintelligence also included lengthy messages from Al Pacino, offering his service as a double agent. Uh, these are really tons of useful nuggets that I do have to offer a state's one message from Al Pacino. What my Bertie doesn't know, he can probably find out. Until now, Al Pacino is widely believed to be one of the pseudonyms used by the agent Carl Mark Force, who last year was convicted of money laundering. Because again, um, he used a lot of pseudonyms, and the, you know, the government has to figure out all these pseudonyms that uh, Force used. Albrecht's defense team argues that Al Pacino is in fact a different law enforcement official, or at least some of the connection to law enforcement. They point to the fact that the initial court filing that he is called Mark Force of corruption listed Al Pacino as one of the pseudonyms, but that the alias is dropped from Force's criminal complaint, indictment, and sequence in court documents. And they know that the $500 a week Al Pacino demanded from Albrecht is strangely small compared to the $50,000 of sum of Bitcoin that Force was paid. Albert's defense says that it's filed the demand that the government turn over mm -hmm. any, any additional information that it has about Al, the Al Pacino figure. It made the filing as part of the pre-trial proceedings of the pending set of charges that Albert still faces in Maryland. Even if the defense lawyers managed to prove the existence of a third corrupt agent, Albert's appeal is conviction in the New York trial, the 32-year-old's last chance to escape life sentence is likely to be affected. A panel of appellate judges reviewing the case is immediately barred from considering evidence not raised at trial or in appellate arguments. Albert's lawyers have filed over the last year. And one of those judges, Gerald Lynch, did this argument about the corrupt agents and appeal hearing last month. How this material exposed to Hillary, he asked, only when the defense described the interference in two convicted wrong agents in the Silk Road investigation. The same judge also argued that nothing indicated that the two agents had already tampered with evidence against Albert. The defense attorney says that indication of evidence tampering may be exactly what the defense has now uncovered. 
She knows that the four different copies of the server data are all either in it before the date from the, the Dirt Pirate Roberts a conversation with Albertine began in summer 2013, or seem to have specific conversations deleted. Only in the newly discovered backup, apparently made by a Silk Road staffer, could someone did not want that to be found, said Albert's the defense attorney, John Sorrell. The defense team hasn't released the newly uncovered tra- chat logs and said the rules of evidence in the Maryland case prevent them from doing so. The clues that obtain evidence are highly enough to change Albert's legal fate, but Lewis says the defense can to keep digging. This is what we have, is it begs the question of what we don't have. We don't know what we don't know. So we will see um, as the Maryland case press forward, um, as his appeal press Forward with the work, there should be some findings pretty soon on that one. The Maryland case is supposed to come out, come around around the same time as well. Uh, all this is very fluid, but it's just very suspicious and very suspect given all that is revealed so far and the fact that these chat logs were hidden. Um, honestly, it, it, it might not change anything for Ross Holder even if he does receive a new trial. He deserves the business the fullness of the case, if you will. So that's pretty much all there is about the issues of Silk Road, just the, the shenanigans of these guys. The case is they're only serving five to six years in prison for, for corruption, for stealing, for evasion, for money, for altering records, for a lot of stuff. And the fact that they're mum about doing more monies and more bitcoins out there and pseudonyms out there about themselves and the fact that they're having them so quickly, so quickly bury all this that, that, there, that, that there are corrupt agents who are working on the Silk Road case. Um, it's just mind-boggling to me personally. So we're going to talk about a couple other things and about the auction of bitcoin as I'm just kind of wrapping up the first episode of the series of the, the one week of you know, this Silk Road marketplace collapse. And some other arrests that happened as a ripple effect of the collapse of the Silk Road marketplace. More and more vendors and millionaires are getting caught up. Um, here's some additional people. Uh, this is from uh, Deep Dot Web, written by C. Aliens, or C. Allens. Uh, Kevin Campbell, a drug treatment worker from Chicago. Pled guilty to the distribution of controlled substance via Silk Road Marketplace after a one year investigation between 2013 and 2014. Chicago law enforcement raided Campbell's Chicago home and found further evidence to connect the suspect to a 2013 crime in Bellevue, Washington. In August 2013, Washington Emergency Response Crews attended a 911 call of an heroin overdose victim with a Silk Road pulled up on the street in front of him. A house guest made a 911 call according to the court documents he fortified in Jordan. Me, 27, unconscious in his bedroom. When investigators arrive at the scene, they began to put the piece together against a dark net vendor that fit uh, Campbell's profile. Admitri left his Silk Road account log in, and investigators easily decoded the messages between me and vendor who sold both heroin and prescription benzodines in the case. The vendor sold his 27 year old heroin at Al. Um, Al. Soma. U.S. Attorney Annette L. Hayes for the U.S. District Court in Seattle, Michigan, the defendant sold additional drugs but never clarified if he sold anything else to overdose victims. The 27 year old died of, a, of IV heroin overdose, and Hayes said nothing of additional drugs in the system. However, other branches of law enforcement independently investigated Campbell's family profile from Colorado. Their court documents described a confidential informant who worked with local police for cash and have been under he sold unknowing Xanax pills to, our, to the officers to give him. Police officers and case detectives found next to the body of the deceased a DVD case with Campbell's fingerprints on it. Officers collected evidence through the one year investigation while now mentioning the announcement of Trace Campbell through the Silk Road to additional marketplaces. The buyer Jordan Dean bought from Campbell until August 2013. The original Silk Road never saw the end of the year, and the FBI bought, brought, it, brought it down in October that same year. However, the prosecutors claimed that Campbell continued to sell heroin and Alpazon. Dies it down online until the day of his arrest in 2014. Law enforcement in Chicago raided the 47 year old drug treatment center in May 
2014, they discovered small amounts of drugs, scale bags, modified DVD cases that matched those received by Colorado police and DT. They kept incriminating notes, although officials never disclosed their full contents. The case is an outrage and a tragedy at the same time, he said, but allowed this defendant to work at the drug treatment center with people in groups of addiction, but at the same time peddled dangerous drugs across the country via the dark web. The heroin this defendant sold killed one of his customers. So we will ask for the court for a that reflects that fact. Heroin overdoses repeatedly find their way to the news and the cycle back to either Kathamanland uh, or the dark net, often both. The majority of the heroin do- overdoses are not remotely related to the dark net, at least in a buyer and victim situation, but some recent cases have begun to change that. Kevin Cannell pleaded guilty to drug distribution in 2017. U.S. District Judge John C. Uh, Kaufner scheduled the defendant's sitting state for May 9, 2017. And according to the terms of the agreed upon in the plea agreement, the prosecutor called for a prison sentence of 10 years maximum. I think this is probably one of those cases where um, I believe this is one of the deaths that was used um, in the Silk Road place, marketplace to indicate that people are overdosed on heroin. And this is one of the reasons why the appeal on uh, Ross Ulrich um, may occur when his life sentence may be appealed because the judge didn't agree with the the fact that the prosecutor used you know, these overdoses as a factor um, that these victims were able to address the court, if you will, or at least the, um, the families of these victims. A Norwegian prosecutor seek 120 bitcoins in court restitutions on March 10th. Norwegian prosecutors have charged three men with online narcotic sales that stem from the Silk Road marketplace. Court officials are now seeking a substantial restitution of 120 bitcoins alongside millions of Norwegian. Uh, the Norwegian prosecutors demand Bitcoin payment from accused cannabis dealers. Uh, this is all from uh, Nigeria today. In the summer of 2015, three men were arrested in the greater Oslo region for operating an online doc- drug operation in an indoor can- cannabis farm. Norwegian police seized a considerable amount of narcotics, claiming they're being sold in the dark marketplace, including the Richard Silk Road. Richard Beck uh, Pesheren. A prosecutor in the case told the press group the group of men used Bitcoin for transactions and gave themselves a level in anonymity. Interestingly, the Norwegian prosecutors are seeking 120 Bitcoin, which is 140k, and 3.1 million Norwegian Kronor, which is uh, 300k, for penalties tied to the charges. Beck Peterson said the cannabis dealers were caught selling Bitcoin during the investigation of police and evidence for the sale of Bitcoins. The case marks the first time the country's prosecutor's department has demanded payment of Bitcoin. However, prosecutor Beck Peterson told the local press that the act does not mean that the state recognizes Bitcoin as legal tender. There's no way an official Norwegian recognition of the use of currency that Beck Peterson told the local reporter. So, again, more and more people are getting caught up in the wake of Silk Road. It seems to be kind of random at the moment. It looks like a lot of these guys um, have had either past cases or interactions with law enforcement. Area, you know, the U.S. has the full access to the Silk Road marketplace servers. There's no, who knows how many more people could be um, prosecuted. I'm not quite sure what the statute of limitations on whatever these type of cases are, but I suspect um, going forward we're going to be hearing more and more uh, Silk Road people being um, charged and caught up in the various risks. And then the last bit we're going to talk about is the auctioning of Bitcoin. So a little bit in the last tip is we'll talk about a little bit about the the auction of <coughs> Bitcoin that was seized by uh, the U.S. Marshal Service. So the U.S. Marshal Service auction twenty seven hundred silver Bitcoins. Um, again, the AI is kind of disputed about exactly how many bitcoins that the government has actually seized, but they have sold up to over 144,000 bitcoins in these different blocks. Um, these are one of the, the last blocks. Uh, the United States Marshal Service recently made a planet's auction more than 27 BTC that's worth over 1.6 million taken from several cases, including those stemmed from the investigation on the Silk Road in its in Ross Ulbricht. Uh, U.S. Intel USMS tells how the soon to be auction bitcoins are linked to some civil, administrative, and criminal matters pursued by the U.S. government in previous years. 
The highest profile among the cases involving the Silk Road Dark Web Marketplace. The first, this is the first ever Dark Web Marketplace, blah blah blah. Russell Big Sittens uh, created, in fact, only about 2.8 Bitcoins in the upcoming actually stand for the whole um, overage case. The U.S. Embassy reveals that the Bitcoins, according to the 1,294 stamp for the civil case associated to Matthew Gilman, Gilman, a drug dealer from Silk Road who has been sentenced to nine years in prison in 2015. The Federal Law Enforcement Agency, agency tells of another 65 BTC in the case of a former U.S. DEA agent, Carl Forrest IV. Uh, he probably has more than that in um, movies talking about Carl Forrest, but he was sentenced to 78 months back in October 2015 for stealing Bitcoins while investigating the Silk Road. Another 664 out of the 2017 come from Sean Robertson's case, who allegedly created an online shop, shop catering to counterfeit debit and credit cards. The Florida man was sentenced to prison for 78 months in November 2015. The Bitcoin auction will be held in August 22nd. Those who wish to participate must register and deposit $100,000. Uh, this auction already happened. Various different people, particularly um, who's the big uh, Draper, have been like the big winners of these different type of auctions. But you know, the reason why I mentioned this, and I went to uh, the show notes into other uh, auctions, is the fact that you know, Call Forces Bitcoin City has taken, um, you know, illegally gained. Demonstration of his corruptness, if you will, have been auctioned off. Um, I suspect he still has more personal interest given what we discussed in the nature of that particular person. Um, and some other, all this which took place in 2016 with auctions. Uh, another case in Australia to sell um, 8 million pounds of seized bitcoins. Uh, the 24,518 bitcoins we sold mostly in box of 2,000 each with a market value about, at the time, was 680 uh, pounds. Um, again, Ernst and Young is the firm organizing these auctions. The 2015 Victoria Asset Confiscated Operation Department confirmed it had take, recently taken possession of 24,500 coins and were trying to make it most of it. Uh, this article comes from BBC News. Um, the previous one was from um, Silk Road Drugs. Um, this is a significant amount. Um, a significant amount. Dr. Greg, Derek Hillum, economic historian, became a chairman of alternative finance to the BBC. He's about a week's worth of new Bitcoin that comes onto the market through mining. Currently, about 4,000 new Bitcoins are generated a day as a reward for miners who offer the computer power to the process of Bitcoin transactions. The seized coins are auctioned in blocks because quickly selling a large amount of coins for cash at Bitcoin exchange could negatively affect the market. Generally, the view that any time 10,000 Bitcoin sell, the market price can be more significant. The price of Bitcoin rose to 530 or 360 pounds on Friday, its highest level since August of 2014. But Dr. Hillman says our Australian authorities have chosen a safe time to sell because there's some uncertainty about what will happen to the value of Bitcoin in July. Uh, the Bitcoin protocol is designed to reduce the number of new Bitcoin miners who are given as a reward for processing transactions every four years. The reward will be half on July 14th, so the price will go up due to reduced supply of new Bitcoins. But there's a question about whether security could decline and the rewards for miners will be significantly. So it's safe to time to sell as there's no guarantee about what might happen in July. Set a president. The Australian Bitcoin auction, which will be open to finish worldwide, is the first such sale outside the U.S. In 2014, the U.S. Marshal Services began auctioning a collection of 175,000 Bitcoins that have been confiscated. From the founder of the internet marketplace Silk Road. The final auction of those attracted 11 bidders, possibly due to the high cost of each block on sale. Uh, Dr. Hillman said the sale of Bitcoin by Australian authorities was an acknowledgement that cryptocurrency was not illegal. Anytime a, a government sells Bitcoin, it's acknowledging this is a different asset to drugs, for example, that would not be sold at auction. That was one of the big takeaways from the US Marshall Service auction. They set a precedent that Bitcoin was not illegal. Australia has been going through its own regulatory process, and this makes us standing that Bitcoin is a legal issue, uh, or is legal in Australia. So there you have it. You know, um, Carl Force, the fourth Bitcoin was sold. Again, I suspect he probably has more in his own cash, and he's not going away for a very long time—longer than six and a half years—versus um, 
we're all celebrations facing a life um, time prison sentence, but she's still going through an appeal. And then you still have the character of Ryan Jones, who still, uh, there has really been no news since March 2017. Uh, last we heard of anything about him as far as news blast goes was January slash December of the beginning of this year, and he still hasn't been extradited to the U.S. Yes, supposedly he has 32 magic words that can change the economic fate of Thailand. So, when news about him um, comes up, we will talk about it. But that pretty much wraps it up. I mean, the case in itself, you know, is very messed up. Um, I do think, even though it looks like the appeal process for Ross Ulbricht and there should be a decision sometime, uh, either April or May, uh, he might get a, a new trial for the simple fact that he's in, in selective prison. Hopefully he will receive a new judge that will um, allow for experts in the Bitcoin field to come into place. The new evidence, the fact that somebody had logged in under a dread pirate, Robert Small, Ross Ulbricht is in custody, um, is a big concern. The fact that his agents, um, the possible third agent, um, had a very uh, corrupted influence, if you will, on the Silk Road marketplace, uh, even though the government has argued that uh, that particular the particular actions had no effect on the case, um, I think it should be presented to the jury. And the fact that it's a very strong likelihood, uh, as we demonstrated, that they one of the uh, alleged uh, hits that they would use this did actually occur. So it's hopeful that you know he does get a new trial. He might end up getting uh, he might end up taking a few. A plea agreement when time is served, um, and he can get out. I mean, there might be a couple more years left for him to serve. Uh, he's been in custody since, since 2013, so he's been in for almost four years now. Um, the possibility he might end up, you know, be there if you only have three more years, um, or he can get out on bail. Um, I, I just believe that he should have a, a fair trial. All evidence should be presented to the court, and that you know. The jury needs to make the decision on whether or not the, uh, the corrupted influence of these agents um, is a factor in the case, whether or not Russell Bridge is, you know, had complete control of his local world marketplace, um, whether or not um, some of the things that have been alleged but wasn't in, uh, put on the docket for indictment actually did in fact occur. So that's it for the show. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Um, the next couple of shows, when we'll we're talking about the aftermath of the Silk Road marketplace collapse. Uh, we're going to talk about fungibility in the, in the cryptocurrency space, particularly with Bitcoin, uh, the rise of privacy cash, um, exchanges. I, mean, I know I talked about it at the top of the show, but uh, we're not going to talk so much about the uh, Bitcoin Unlimited Classic or all the whole hoopla about far fork, soft fork, the, those type of issues that about the block size and the going on in the Bitcoin um, space. Um, we'll talk a little bit about China. If there's any kind of news so far, they haven't allowed for the withdrawals of Bitcoin um, or any cryptocurrency in China. There has been some little bit of news, but there hasn't really been any really true confirmation. And it's, we're in deep in March now. And March is about to go into April, so it's been a couple months. Um, we might just be just talking in general just about the rise of the need for decentralized exchanges and then this uh, decentralized uh, marketplaces in general. Um, the rise of those type of um, technologies, if you will, those type of places and how, as a result, the collapse of uh, the Silk Road marketplace and the way the government handled that particular case. So thank you very much for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you, and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.